Let's speak with Gina Miller, leader of True uh, the True and Fair Party, and of course, very active campaigner for Remain. Gina, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Ian. Um, so, this point, the EU diplomat saying we believe his comments are significant. Did you think they were significant? I think they were significant, but they don't go far enough. I mean, this idea, I, I mean, first of all, you're right. I don't think this was policy. This was something that he'd said in a green room or somewhere that was picked up. But it just um, does not go far enough mm -hmm. in that, uh, you know, yes, of course, we don't want to diverge when it comes to standards on food, on water, which we've already done. Um, uh, you know, we want to keep those standards, workers' rights, we want to keep that. But is that enough? And if you look at the polls, it's not just what the politicians are saying, it's what the public are saying, that, you know, they're not happy with the situation, Brexit is not working, we need to move forward to a closer relationship. But um, if you look at the front cover of the New European today, you'll find out that I'm definitely not a fan of the stance he's taking at the moment, because it's just not bold enough. If you look at um, a poll today that was in the Daily Express, you know, asking if there should be a second referendum, 84% of people in that poll said yes. People want something new when it comes to the relationship with the EU. That's either rejoining or some sort of tiered relationship, whatever it is. They want some clarity and some conviction. But and they've all, Gina, they've all the given Labour it a Party. go, haven't they? They all said, look, we can, you know, we had Boris's oven-ready deal. You know, Theresa May went in there saying, you know, I can, I can make this work and it didn't quite work. And Boris gave it a go and it didn't quite work. The big Northern Ireland issue that people seem to forget about for reasons unknown because it was so significant, it was glaring at them. That got put to one side. Liz Truss didn't do very much. He was only there for half an hour, of course. Rishi Sunak is now sort of saying he's given it a go. He's gone over there to meet Macron. They're apparently quite friendly. They all claim to want a better deal, but ultimately, isn't the, doesn't the smart money say the only deal the EU would countenance is coming back in? There is no... Third countries can't carve out specific deals. The EU will always, always defend their single market and the customs union. And what they've talked about, and actually it's not new, I know it's been reported this week that um, this tiered option of a inner circle and a, and a, a lesser sort of circle satellite uh, membership, um, that Macron mentioned or people are talking about this week, actually was talked about in 2015. And Cameron tried it and he wasn't forceful enough. And I have to say, Boris Johnson, we know from Lord Frost and Boris Johnson, that they never really went in there fighting and they knew they'd have to renege on the deal. They knew it wasn't actually a deal that would stick. Um, and I think we have to be much more bold in where we go in to say that, right, we, we, we're there, we were an influential partner, we can still be an influential partner, but we want to preserve our sovereignty, we want to um, preserve our pound. What is wrong with us going and trying to do that? Because the EU, the signals from the EU members are that actually they need us. This is not just hurting our Brexit. It's not just hurting the UK. Mm. It is hurting the EU as well. But what does that look like, Gina? What, what's, I mean, we want to have a good relationship with the EU and have a good relationship with Australia and all India, all these other countries. Of course we do. But what does it look like? What, what is standing in the way of, of simply saying to Macron, Schultz or whoever, look, you know, we, we, we want to work with you guys. That was the whole point of Brexit, wasn't it? That we don't have to be in it to still have a good relationship. So what are we not doing at the moment that we could still do without rejoining? the EU we could we could start by actually saying what we mean and sticking to it because the bad blood that's created been created over the last few years has not been great there's a lot of a bad faith um, and we're not trusted uh, that our politicians will actually not do you you turn or deliver on what they're saying so we have a lot of ground to make up when it comes to building rebuilding trust between the two but one of the urgent things we should be doing and this is very important is be looking at things like the veterinary agreement because since 20 um january 2020 there's been no checks on food coming in from the eu and this is really hurting our farmers and our biosecurity so we should be looking at where can we make some really quick wins on the road to rejoining because i think ultimately that is where the people are now and that's where we are best placed to be at the top table you say that there was a survey in the uh, in the daily express i mean we see these all the time some people say yes we should rejoin and others uh, are not so struck it's fair to say though gina there's no way right now of telling given everything that's happened in geopolitics and COVID and um, all manner of international issues around energy and Ukraine, etc., it's very hard to intelligently ascertain the status of leaving, right? I mean, because I, I see headlines every week that look rather positive, and I see some headlines that look rather negative, and if you wanted to, you could attribute both to either leaving or the fact that we did leave 
to blame, etc. Um, there's no, there's no way we can. I mean, you said it was a disaster. I hear people keep wheeling that one out. I don't really see any specific evidence of that. I can see some hurdles and some bits and pieces where we haven't crossed the T's and dotted the I's yet. But that was always a given that it would take some time. It's too early to tell whether it's fully worked, right, or has been a disaster, as you would say. So the vote was in 2016. That's seven years ago. We've had the deal, which was um, in 2030 but we already can see the direction of travel. I mean, the EU, can I just put you, the government's yep. own figures say that it will take 10 to 15 years before they even have any idea of whether this will work or not. Are we willing to wait that long? But we already know that underlying core inflation, at least a third of that is linked to Brexit. Um, we already know that small farmers, that uh, you know, most businesses are saying that they cannot survive when it comes to people and the barriers to trade because of Brexit, that's directly associated with them. When it comes to pharmaceuticals, the REACH agreement, every pharmaceutical um, person I speak to or business says that because we haven't signed up to REACH, it is damaging the amount of paperwork they have to, um, one person I spoke to, one business said it's about 1.5 million pounds more per year that they're having to budget just for the paperwork of importing drugs. These are real examples. The evidence is there of the damage that Brexit is doing to our country, even if you strip out COVID and the illegal war in Ukraine. But in I mean, presumably Japan has the same hurdles if they're dealing with the EU. Australia would have the same hurdles. So would India and any other non-EU country. Uh, they seem to survive. Because, I mean, it's not a law of physics that you have to be in the EU to make life work, right? No, but it is a law of gravity that you tend to deal with your nearest partners, trading partners, especially from an environmental point of view. That's very important that we do trade with our um, nearest and dearest partners, and also from a point of view of security and geopolitics that we are aligned with our neighbours. So those, but we're those in, are we're in NATO, aren't we? I mean, we have security yeah, wise, that isn't affecting. We're in NATO, so that that bit doesn't work. We've got a, 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 a world trading organisation that looks after global trade as well. The EU is not just what well, there's the G7, there's all of those organisations. The EU is not the sort of bastion of all goodness. It's not the the font of everything. No, it's the not, oracle no, no, I, of Delphi saying, when it I... comes to solutions. No, Ian, I'm not saying it's a bastion of all good. And actually, you know, there's no silver bullet that would be solved. You know, for years and years, there's very been a lack of investment in proper pol political decisions when it comes to our domestic politics. You can't blame the EU for that. You know, we've underinvested in our schools, uh, in our um, hospitals. You know, those are domestic policies that have not been, in my view, been strong enough in the way that our politicians have delivered that. So that's not to do okay. with the EU. But when it comes to geopolitics, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to our security, when it comes to mass movement of people which will increase as climate changes and we have more unsettled politics around the world and wars between different nations these things do matter when we are in a union rather than in smaller units okay separate point gina you're the leader of the true and fair party uh, there might be an election in the next six months but certainly within the next Ooh, 12 there's months. likely to be one well they, i mean there's, there's there is some rumbles over there in the westminster jungle that it could I be have made. Heard them. i have to say i was surprised that you'd heard them too but i'm, I'm yeah, yeah. we're hearing the same rumbles. although D damian green speculated earlier on this program that it, it, it he thinks it might be october so let's say a, a year um how many seats are you going to, how many constituencies are you going to be standing in as your true and fair party? We're standing in eight seats. I'm standing against Chris Grayling in Epsom and Yule. We have a candidate running in the mid-Bedfordshire by-election on the 19th of October. Um, we're starting from a, you know, it's not easy for a small party doing this, but first election, by-election that we're fighting, we're already polling twice as much as the Green Party from a st starting still. So, you yes. know, the public are looking Is for something different. Is that an endorsement that you're polling twice as much as the Green Party? I mean, they, they tend not to do very well at all, Gina. Yeah, but what I'm saying is we're from a standing start. You know, this is the Fair first point. time that we're actually out there talking yep. to people. And the small parties have not done that. So we are standing in seven seats. And as I said, Chris Grayling is the one I'm standing against in Epsom and Yule. Okay. And we will offer people an option and see what they say. Well, I'm about to speak to Natalie Bennett, as I'm sure you know, is the former leader of the Green Party. Any message? Well, they should have been coming out a lot stronger in that speech on Wednesday. I mean, that was an anti-environmental speech that Mr Sunak made on Wednesday, and the Green Party should have been all over it. There it is. Gina, thank you. Gina Miller, uh, the leader of the True and Fair Party, arguably one of the most famous Remainers in the land.